Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I have, uh, you have the links of today's uh, session. Uh, it, its name is 1019NTK. And I also put the, the link to the session of uh, last Thursday about uh, uh, the gradient descent because there were some corrections, the small corrections, but corrections nevertheless. So today's session is devoted to what, um, roughly speaking, can be called a neural tangent kernel and uh, the training dynamics of neural networks. So what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, uh, remember the, the syllabus, it was a training dynamics, neural tangent kernel, the kernel gradient, basic training, and the convergence of the stochastic gradient descent. As references, primarily, uh, one should focus on the topics are studied in the papers one, which is uh, Jacot Gabriel Anglais, Natural Kernel Learning, Natural Tangent Kernel, Convergence and Generalization in Neural Networks. And two, which is somehow uh, presupposes the paper number one, which is this Chizat, Oyalon, and Bach on lazy training in differentiable programming. Um, I have to mention other serviceable materials. Uh, first of all, the extensive treatise three, which is uh, Roberts Yaida Hanin, the principles of deep learning theory. Uh, this is a very recent book. It will be published in uh, Cambridge University Press, but I could get a draft and this is the one I, I am looking. I check when I need to. Um, well, so, and then you have a survey for and other papers. Now the topics I will be uh, talking about will be first neurons, uh, then uh, neural networks, then training these neural networks. I'll devote um, quite some time to uh, these topics because I think that uh, they are crucial, the concepts and, and the ideas to, to read further papers and to keep uh, researching and studying them. But, uh, I distinguish training and abstract from training techniques. And then we, uh, Toward the end, we are going to speak about the neural tension kernel, the lazy regime for white neural networks. Now let's go to neurons. About the neurons, I will speak a little bit about Cajal, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, uh, the biological model, just a little bit, the artificial model, and uh, a little list of activation functions which are important for, uh, for neural networks. So here, this is just showing you some of the many hundreds or thousands of drawings that uh, Ramon y Cajal drew in his study of the brain. In general, the brain could be, uh, could be of birds, of other mammals, of animals, and so on, and also human. Uh, I think that it's interesting that um, the peak year, according to himself, was 1888, which was in a period that he was in Barcelona. Uh, and in particular, he discovered the, the mechanisms that govern the morphology and connective processes of gray matter nerve cells of the cere cerebral spinal, spinal, spinal nervous systems. So in particular of the, of the neocortex of mammals, very important. Um, well, 
the biological model of a neuron, you have here a drawing. Uh, in green, you have a neuron. Its body is B, labeled B. Then uh, this cell has an exon, which is labeled A. And this exon ramifies with uh, many, many dendrites, which in the case of uh, the human brain can be in the thousands. Uh, now these dendrites connect to uh, other dendrites going to other neurons through synapses, uh, which are labeled as S. And uh, of course, this, this neuron, uh, this green neuron receives signals from other neurons like the, from the dendrites, from dendrites of D, of uh, the blue ones, and so on, okay? In the brain, there are also feedback, so that neurons that go back to neurons that feed to the, but we, in, in the present stage of artificial neural networks, this is seldom considered. This uh, picture is adapted from a book by Ertel of 2017, uh, which was uh, just an introduction to artificial intelligence. Now, the, the artificial model of a neuron is depicted here. Uh, you have here uh, the body of the neuron is this circle decorated with a curve and the sigma. I will explain in a moment what is this. And then there are incoming uh, quantities, x1, x2, xn. And these quantities before reaching uh, the neuron, the, the body of the neuron, uh, are qualified by weights W1, W2, WN, one weight for each entry. Well, the qualification is that it multiply, they multiply. So you have WX1 plus w, WN XN. This is what goes in the neuron. Now the neuron, the biological neurons, it's known very recently, experiments are very complicated cells, much more complicated than that, uh, the picture before or the picture I am going here. And the, I think that this will be relevant in the near future uh, to take into account the complexity of the structure of neurons. But for today, I think we are going to stay with this uh, simple picture. Now, uh, in general, new, there is a bias, which is called, uh, normally it's called B, but here can be called W0. Now this can be treated with the same model by putting uh, an entry that is constantly equals one and then a weight W0. So uh, the entry to the neuron is W0 plus WX1 plus WNXN, which can be uh, simplified in notation as W dot X. Now, when this goes in, it does not generate an output directly, but it depends on a function that generically has this, this form, is a sigmoid. So the output of the neuron is the, the, the mm, what I explained here, w dot x. Uh, this is uh, uh, what goes to the sigma, and the sigma computes this number. And this is what goes to whatever, whatever other neurons this neuron is connected to. The sigma is called an activation function. And uh, there are many sorts of this, as I will review in a moment. And uh, this expression here, uh, sometimes is called pre-activation. So is collecting what is coming in to the neuron. This is the pre-activation. And then with the, the sigma decides whether to fire or not, or in what degree to fire to the other neurons. And this is the sigma. So uh, in symbols, uh, a neuron is a function that maps an X, that vector of incoming uh, quantities 
to f double f w x because it depends on these parameters w. Uh, so it's a parametric function. These parameters w are usually called weights also, and uh, the sigma sigma I, I said it before activation function, and one of them is uh, the logistic that we reviewed in the first session. Sigma of t equals the inverse of one plus exponential of minus t. In this case, actually, if you uh, go over the first session, you are going to see that this neuron computes the logistic regression. If we need to display separately the, the bias and the other weights, I'm going to write in this way, for example. So as far as activation functions, there is, of course, the, the logistic, the sigmoid, which is here. Its range is from 0 to 1. Uh, but then there are other possible uh, uh, activations, which are, are much used. Maybe uh, the, simplest, sim the simplest one is the linear, which does nothing, is the identity. Its range is minus infinity to plus infinity, and it's on, only used in very special cases. So I, I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, in the case of the perceptron, the, the activation is zero if x is less than some threshold, tau, and is one if it's bigger than this threshold, tau. Well, this, in some sense, is what the, the, the biological neurons do because they accumulate incoming signals, and when all of them go beyond some threshold, the neuron fires. Otherwise, it stays quiet. Okay. This perceptron was the first actually a neuron uh, produced uh, historically, uh, a neuron that really, an artificial neuron that really worked. Now there is this um, ReLU is, uh, um, uh, I never remember what RE means. It's some form, some form of, uh, reshaped uh, linear unit or something like that. We will see in a, min in a minute why it is. It range, this is the maximum between zero, the maximum of zero and X, and has this picture here, the graph is this. Before zero, it's zero. After zero is X. So uh, this is uh, indeed like the linear one, but uh, reformed before zero, okay? or whatever it means uh, There is also the, the hyperbolic tension. This is used. In this case, the range is between minus one and one. It has a sigmoid form, but uh, is not above, above zero, but is symmetrical with respect to zero, the, 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 the graph. And finally, there is one that is depicted here, the soft plus which is the, the logarithm of one plus EX. Has this graph here, you see that uh, asymptotically toward the right is like uh, the ReLU and asymptotically toward the left is also equal to the ReLU. So this is a differentiable version of the ReLU. Well, the ReLU is also differentiable except at the, at the origin. Uh, of course, the differential is zero to the left of zero. It is one to the right of zero, and it is undefined at zero. So, because there is a singularity of the differential. But nevertheless, it works quite well even when you need the differential. If you take as differential uh, precisely what uh, uh, I said, zero or one, which is like the perceptron but with a threshold of one. Now, in the case of the paper number one I mentioned before, they need uh, an activation that is differentiable and that has two 
two derivatives, and then the second derivative is bounded. Uh, I will show you a little later uh, this, this picture of this. Let's go to neural networks. I will be uh, review some ground notions, then what I call the array model, or it's called the array model, the training, the conventional training, the over-parameterized training, and the training techniques. Well, here is some humor. He has that. For me, metaphorically, the wheel would represent technology up to, I don't know, up to the advent of the digital era. So be, let's say before uh, Turing, before um, Shannon, or before von Neumann and so on, okay? Uh, the wheel could represent this. E and what the innovation of uh, the character on the right that says, my invention is even more remarkable than yours. It is the simple declarative sentence. I think that, that this may be a metaphor of uh, artificial intelligence, and in particular, uh, algorithmic learning. So it's a remarkable thing, maybe more remarkable than any technology that has uh, come so far in the history of mankind. Well, the ground notions, uh, a neural network is uh, a composition of neurons according to some graph of connections that is called the architecture of the net. Uh, we are going to see some pictures in a moment. Here we will consider the case of directed graphs and those leaving aside nets that could have feedback or that are undirected and so on. These nets, there are such nets like the Hopfield networks or the Volvo's machines, but we are not going to touch that in this, in this course. Now, the standard architecture of a neural network is a, a directed graph a stru structured in layers, Lj, as in this formula. Um, and the functional signature, so what it does is that it takes an input that is captured by the entry layer L0, and it goes through all the layers and produces an output at the end. Since uh, these functions will be parameterized, the function going from input to output will be a parameterized function. And therefore, it's a family of functions, actually, with the network computes. Now, the integer d here is called the depth of the net. Conventionally, it, the, the, we say that the network is deep if uh, d is bigger than 2. So it means that uh, there has to be uh, at least one hidden, the, the L1, LD minus one, sorry. L1, LD minus one are called hidden layers. L0 and LD are called visible layers. And therefore, uh, there has to be at least a hidden layer for a network to be considered deep. Otherwise it's called shallow, okay? Um, well, here you have uh, some examples. This is very simple, just to not to complicate the picture. Here you have uh, an input of three neurons, uh, three nodes, if you want. Uh, these nodes connect, each one connects to the three neurons coming in layer L1. Uh, each one of them connects to the three, and then these three are already output neurons. In this case, since anyone in L0 connects to anyone in L1, you say that this is a, a fully connected uh, layer. So L1 is a fully connected to the previous layer. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the image B, here you have five entries. These entries connect to layer to the three neurons in layer L1, but it's not fully connected. For example, uh, you see that the first neuron in L1 receives input from X1, X2, and X3, but not from X4 and X5, and similarly with the other ones. Whereas the connection of L1 and L2 
again is fully connected. And then the two neurons in L2 are already output neurons. Now, some remarks on these pictures, and have them in your uh, mind eye. Uh, each hidden neuron receives the outputs of the three, uh, of three of the five input neurons. I am referring to the image B. So the connections from L0 to L1 require nine, nine weights. Sorry, no, I'm referring still to, uh, to A. Nine weights, three by three, nine, okay. Now there is the possibility that the three, uh, I correct again, I'm referring to picture B, okay? Uh, so we would need, if all the weights were independent, we would need nine weights. But there would be the possibility, maybe let's show it again, that uh, these weights, the three weights that go to the first uh, hidden neuron, the three weights that go to the second hidden neuron and the three weights that go to the third hidden neuron, that they would be, could be the same. In which case, you all, in, instead of nine weights, uh, you could, uh, could just have three weights, okay? Well, this prefigures what are going to be called convolutional neural networks that I will explain a little later. If you look at, at the case in which they share weights, as I said, and you look at the, the outputs yj of the output neurons, uh, excuse me, of the, of the yj's arriving to the hidden layer, then you find that uh, we have this expression. And this is the, what is called the cor cross correlation of w and x expressed as vectors. And this is the operation, okay? Now, the width of the layer LJ is the number of its nodes or neurons. Uh, I, I'm going to call it NJ. And uh, one says that a, a network is wide if these numbers are very high, okay? I said already that the depth is D. The D can be quite large, but not as large as the width in general. Maybe it can go to the hundreds or thousands, but not more. Well, now, how does this work functionally? Functionally, the layer LJ takes an input, which is the output of the, of the previous layer, the LJ minus one, and produces an output X prime. You remember that it will be a preactivation, some, some expression, and then this preactivation will be activated by the activation function, okay? Now, so at the end, we have a map Fj that maps X to X prime, which depends on, not only on the weights connecting Lj minus one to Fj, but also on uh, the activation function. The particulars of uh, these weights and of this uh, activation is what defines the kind of the layer LJ. Uh, I will describe the main kinds a little later, okay? Now, the input X0 to L0 is the signal to be processed. It can be a sound, which is one dimensional, or an image, which can be two dimensional, or even more complicated, as I will say. And then uh, the output of LD, which is the output layer, is the transformation produced by the net on the entry x0. It is useful. It is the result of applying progressively the maps f1, fd. So uh, actually the final map is the composition f1, then f2, then fd minus one, then fd. I think that uh, it may be also a metaphor, a useful metaphor to uh, compare l0 to the sensory organs of living organ of living uh, living beings, could be uh, seeing, could be hearing, could be uh, touch, and so on. Okay. Now the hidden layers uh, are somehow akin to whatever the brain is doing inside, uh, and the output 
is akin to the signals sent by the brain to the various organs involved in the behavior of the being. Could be locomotion, could be a special sort of locomotion, which phonation, and so on. Okay. Of course, we are very far from uh, replicating what uh, a biological uh, brain does. And maybe it does not make much sense to try to replicate it as it is, but it can be done differently. Well, just let me say that the fins of uh, fish did not invent the helixes uh, of, the, of the ships. Uh, the, the, the wings of birds did not invent the wings of airplanes and so on. Uh, so I guess that the neurons uh, at some point will also be quite different than the biological neurons and doing whatever uh, it is intended to do, we, we intend them to do technologically. Now, the map FJ that sends X to X prime is parameterized by a set, by the set WJ of the weights that connect, the, of the connections between LJ minus one, the LJ minus one neurons and the LJ neurons. So that we can write that FJ is F with the parameters WJ. Therefore, uh, the final map computed by the neural network uh, involves the, the union of all the weights. This is the joint union actually. And uh, the final function computed by the network is FW1 composed by, composed with and so on until FWD. Since the activation functions of the neurons are most often, as I said before, nonlinear, FW may be a highly nonlinear map. Usually it is a very highly nonlinear map. By the way, if uh, the activation is the ReLU, which is locally affine or, or affine, piecewise affine, then the functions computed by the network are piecewise affine. And uh, it is known that uh, piecewise affine functions are sufficient to approximate any um, a continuous function. And therefore, uh, this is one way of seeing the resilience of neural networks for computing any function. Well, let me say that the number of parameters is generally large or very large. Uh, the more so, the wider or, and deeper the net is. At present, the number of parameters of the largest artificial neural networks is of the order, order or approaching, approaching 10 to the 12. So 1 billion uh, European billion. In biological terms, these weights play the role of the synaptic potentials of the neocortex. But these are still up outnumber and much more so if we take into account the complexity of the biological neurons by more than two orders of magnitude, the biggest number of artificial connections. Well, here, um, since I'm, <laughs> I also a little piece of fun. Uh, I don't know. I somehow I feel like this character trying to write something, uh, and he says, "If it if it was nonfiction, I'd have all sorts of reference material, uh, material, and I wouldn't need you. You means I guess the 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 muse, uh, the inspiration." Well, take it at, at, as you like. The array model works as follows. Uh, in general, X and X prime, I didn't say what they were. Uh, in principle, you could suppose they, were, they are vectors and arrays, as I will say now, are some special kind of vectors. Uh, but it is uh, useful to consider that X and X prime and also the parameters, Wj and Bj, weights and biases are multidimensional arrays or multi-axial arrays, whose nature is chosen according to the processing that has to be achieved. Uh, a short account of what is the, what are these arrays uh, will be that uh, vectors and dimensional vectors 
will have type square bracket Z. Uh, then if you look at matrices of N, N1 rows and N2 columns, brackets N1 and 2 will be the type of, of those matrices, okay? In general, brackets N1 and 2 and, 2 and D will denote the type of a D axial, let's deal with D axis, array with axis dimensions N1 and D. Um, for example, uh, matrices of N1 rows and N2 columns are quite good to represent monochrome images. But if you go to red, green, blue images, it's like you had three images in parallel, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And therefore this is encoded in N1, N2, 3 array. Or this in, in when you take signal from the well, uh, there are times that you need more channels than three uh, to, to uh, record whatever goes on uh, in, the, in the electromagnetic spectrum, for example. And then you can put N3 if you need N3 channels for that. One possibility is eight, for example, that uh, we use by satellites when taking uh, signals from the Earth. Now, the parameters associated to a fully connected or to a convolutional layers are encoded by an array of weights, W, and the bias array, B. And uh, in this case, the function F computed by, by the layer has as preactivation an operation between the array X and the array W. Let me call the star sub I, depending on which one you choose, plus the array B. Of course, for this to make sense, this array, array and this array have to, have to have the same type, okay? And then uh, you activate this by applying your activation functions function uh, element-wise. Anytime you see an activation in front of a preactivation and a preactivation array, it means that sigma is applied component-wise. Uh, this, you know, in in computer systems like MATLAB or, or other systems, this is done automatically. Uh, when you apply a scalar function to an array, it is applied uh, component-wise. Now, as, as I said, a star sub pi is a pairing specific of the layer and sigma is the activation that is applied component-wise. The expression f sub j tilde of x, the thing that is inside, and I'm sorry to repeat, it's, uh, is the preactivation of the layer. And clearly then uh, the function returns the, the, uh, the result of activating this preactivation. Well, I already said something about the, oh, here it is rectified linear unit, which is quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, this, even though the derivative is the jump function is very useful in practical machine learning. Now, uh, just to have a little picture of what uh, the things we have been saying, uh, we have been saying mean, uh, for fully connected layers, X and X prime are vectors and W is a matrix. And the, the coupling, the product between the vector and the matrix is just matrix product, a row times a matrix. By the way, I should say that many people like to write the vectors in columns, and then this would be the other way around, uh, WXX. But I prefer always to write vectors uh, in row form. And if I need a column form, I transpose the vector. So let's do it explicitly for an X in, uh, in the component of dimension N sub K minus one. Uh, if this is the output of the layer LK minus one, then W is a matrix or having N sub K minus one rows and NK columns. And X prime is 
rho of n chi components. Okay, and the, the output of the layer x, uh, x prime is the output of the layer RK is sigma of xw. In detail for an example, you have it here, x1, x2, x3. This is LK minus one. Then you have two neurons here. You connect x1 to this one by w upper one one with this one by w upper one two. So the upper index is uh, the neuron you come from and the sub index is the neuron you go to. And so with the other ones, okay? And here I represent with capital sigma as less a small sigma, the operations done by the neuron, which is summing, doing the linear combination of the inputs and the weights, which is the sigma, and then applying the activation and, and uh, giving the output of the neuron. Now, if you complicate a little bit for the case of cross correlation, by the way, I should say that uh, what uh, people call convolutional neural networks, the operation involved between arrays is cross correlation. Most of the time is cross correlation. Uh, as far as uh, functionality, it doesn't matter. It can be cross correlation, it works just, just as fine. So let me take here a three, three, two array. It means that it has two three by three uh, matrices. Uh, there is one. You see, it's very simple, zero to eight uh, in, in order. And the, the one behind is one to nine, also in order, okay? This is this array X. Now the W is a two, 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 one. I'm going to see a little later what this one means, but the two, two, two means that you have two matrices is two by two, zero, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. The numbers are irrelevant here. Now, what do you do to pair this to this, uh, this one will, will appear here at the end, is that you slide this front two by two matrix, you slide it over this three by three matrix, and then you have one possibility, which is the one here. You move one step to the right, you have another possibility. You move one step down and to the left, you have another possibility here. And finally, this possibility. So it means that when you do this times this, it means that you are going to get, um, it's going to be this uh, times this, which is going to be a two by two. It's not, not, not represented here because this is the sum of this and this, okay? But you, you see what it means, you take, Zero times zero, zero, one times one, one, three times two, six, four times three, uh, 12, 12 and six, uh, 18, 19. So uh, in doing this product, you would have uh, here a 19, okay? Similarly, you do this one here, you'd have one times four times 12 times 20 and add it with the one computer here, would be the 56, okay? Now, why do you add these two? You could end these two here, you could end here, uh, putting uh, again a two, two, two uh, array. But when you put a one here, uh, this means that you want a single exit, a single, uh, single component. So you do not want a two, 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 but a two, two, one. This one here reappears here. And this for you have to add the thing. And uh, these two here and these two means that if you look at them, they, they mean that uh, it's the index with which you sum and has to be the same. In order to define this, this index has to be the same. The 30 index is equal to the 30 index. Now, if you try to do that uh, analytically, what you get is what you have in this slide. So, uh, the cross correlation uh, X cross W, X is an array of type N1, N2, N3 in general. 
Again, I put a different color so that you get the N3, the W with the same color. Uh, w is, uh, has type W1, W2, N3, M3. Now N1 and 2 is like a matrix. You may imagine that it's a matrix. And the N3 means that you have N3 matrices, parallel matrices, okay? Now in the filter, you have the first two parameters represent the window that you slide over the X. So uh, it would be in the previous example, it would be the two, two, okay? Now these and these are shared. And then M3 is the num the, the output, the number of channels of the output array. Now, when you do all this and mimic or try to uh, translate the example before in analytics, what you get is this. The value of Y, this is pre-activation, at I, J, K will depend on, on a sliding. This is the sliding from N to zero to W minus one, N to zero to W two minus one. A sliding, so this is why I take I plus M, J plus M, R, any R here. And uh, you multiply by the W, M, N, the R, K, you do this product, and, uh, and did you sum with respect to R, like before, okay? And this, since K can be up to M3, at the end, you get what you wanted, uh, the array of the, of the type you need. Well, the type depends on the W. You surely uh, see, sorry, surely see that when uh, you do this here, okay, this product like this one, you have, even though this is three by three, you only have two positions for this sliding window. Two in horizontal and two vertical. This is why you get a two by two. So this, again, uh, you have to take care of this, uh, but in the end, all it's just, believe me, uh, putting together what I said before. And if you want to use uh, a compact notation, which is the slicing conventions, uh, when you do arrays, I colon I plus W1 minus one means the range going from I to I plus W minus one. Same with this range and then the R. Here, if you do not put the M, which is uh, the M you had here, uh, you, the colon means that it's any one of them. And this star is multiplying this matrix with this matrix comp component-wise and adding is the, the, the inner product of this matrix with this matrix. And this gives a component and then doing all the components, you have uh, the cross correlation product. I have just to mention it because uh, in, the, in the references, especially the ones more applied or more yeah. engineering, uh, there is a downsampled cross correlation, which is just as before, but it's a product that depends on a stride. It's a, a positive integer, okay? Well, it's just the same, but uh, you count by, you do a steps of S. So you take not I, but IS, not J, but JS, and uh, you start counting here, and then except this is all the same, okay? Um, when in a neural network, you have at least one convolutional layer, then uh, it is customary to say that the, the, the network is convolutional, no matter what the other components are doing. Well, there is another important thing, especially in applications again, which is the max pooling, max pool. In this case, uh, the, 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 the filter is represented by two numbers, W1, W2. So it's the window, 
the, the dimensions of a window. And there is also uh, an S, which is the stripe that you can, you, you can make. Uh, now this, how does it go? Well, S by default is one, so you may imagine that this one. It goes like before, you have to, uh, to look at X from I to I plus W1 minus one, and from J to J plus W2 minus one, and any K you are looking at, okay? But instead of doing an operation uh, as before, you just take the maximum of this. So this is, uh, you look at the window and you look at the maximum of what you find in that window, okay? This is the maximum pool. You put together and take the maximum, okay? And the shape is as before you have, if S is one is, uh, the highest number less than or equal to n minus w one, because you lose in a sliding, uh, you do not have all the possible positions. There, are, you, you decrease by w one, and if there is an s, you have to divide and take the integer, the integer part. Well, just for a picture of uh, one neural network, a convolutional neural network, here you have an input. This is an adaptation of something that I, I found in the in internet, which I thought it was just good enough for uh, as an example, but uh, adapted to, here there are several things that are adapted by myself. Now, this is an image of a boat, barely, but it's a piece of a boat. So from input to the next one, you go by a convolution. Since it's a convolution, the size is the same. It is true that you take something here and this is mapped into something here, okay? But the, the thing remains the same. Now, next uh, layer, you do a pooling. Since you do a pooling, the size decreases and much more so if, uh, the, um, if the stride was bigger than one, okay? This is why these are less. Are, have dimensions less than these ones. Now again, you do a convolution. So you, you look at, you move the window and you compute numbers and you put them here. Again, the size is reflected. Now in here, you had, uh, you, you had one channel for this image, but then you do a convolution that has three channels, one, two, three. Again, when you do this pooling, uh, the number of channels remains the same. So it's three. But when you do this convolution, you do it in such a way that uh, the, uh, the channels in the output are six. So this is why you have here six, let's say images or, or images like uh, of the same size that you had before, okay? Now you do another pooling. So therefore you go still even smaller uh, by pooling this window and you get a value here. So you have again, six, um, six channels. And then the, the two last ones or the three last ones, you do a fully connected. This fully connected, well, this represents the, the size. So you have 12 and 12 and four. It means that these six are converted into 12. So, it was 12 channels. Then you do it the same here. Uh, you from 12 to 12. And then finally, you output four. And these numbers, uh, the highest one is the one that takes, the, the one that you take as representing whatever uh, in the terminology of the first session, whatever the expert or the supervisor said it was. So if this is close, if it would be the supervisor would have been, this is about one, okay? Uh, you get 0 0.94, so you decide here, already a hard decision. This is a soft decision. This is a soft output. If you take the highest one, this is a hard decision, but in this case, it would be okay. This is more or less what you can expect of how neural networks work, convolution or fully connected or whatever, except that, the width of uh, the layers may be much higher and there are people 
and you, we are going to see some later, that there are theorems when you make the width go to infinity and uh, the depth, which in here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, could be much larger, okay? In particular, very performing networks have hundreds uh, on the hundreds, or the other hundreds layers, okay? Well, now we go to training and I put this thing to see it inspires you a little bit. Well, you know this, that uh, we always get corrections. And I think that, um, uh, oh, somebody said rectified linear unit. Thank you very much, but I didn't pay attention until later. Sorry, okay. Um, so uh, these corrections, uh, well, you have to get some inspiration to get the correction, or at least these uh, muses have to tell you, correct this, correct that. So training. Um, let me devote a few more minutes to that. A training algorithm for the network two, the formula of the ends, using a label data set, D, upper, D star. Remember that I used D when it was only data, and D star when it was label data. Well, this is any procedure to adjust the weights wj and the bias is bj, so that the function, the final function, the composition of all them computed by the net has a good balance between the learning and the generalizing, generalization rates. The learning is, def is defined as the number, as the proportion of examples that the network classifies or, or uh, outputs correctly or decides correctly. On the other hand, the generalization, generalization rates is the proportion of uh, cases out of the testing cases, this is another, another, another sample, uh, that are classified correctly or are decided correctly, okay? This is usually done by iterating two steps, which together doing, doing one step at the other is uh, usually is called an epoch. If there is a four pass ending, the four pass takes the input, produces the output, and then there is a loss at the end that tells you how, or tells the algorithm how close the output is to what it should be. Um, and finally, there is a backward pass that modifies the parameters in general it is, it's called backward progression algorithm. It modifies the parameters from starting from the last and going backward until the, the first in such a way that they decrease the loss incurred in the fourth step. This sounds like a gradient descent, okay? Which it is. Or uh, um, um, a statistical, a stochastic gradient descent, okay? Actually, the most, the, the really performant, uh, uh, networks use a stochastic gradient descent on various forms that I already mentioned in the, se uh, session, in the session last Thursday. Now, the conventional training, this means up to maybe three or four years ago, not more, okay? It, were, it, were, it, it, uh, it was pictured like this, okay? So here you have in the horizontal axis, the epochs of training, the epochs. You have a fixed neural, neural network, so the number of parameters stays the same, but these parameters, you, you update their values by, by going through epochs. Now, in general, what you, you get is that once you go, you advance through the epochs, the error in learning diminishes is this, this curve here, okay? Goes down and down and down and down. And actually, if, if you keep going, uh, if there are enough parameters in the, in the network, you arrive almost to zero. What does it mean training error nearly zero? It means that the network has learned by rote anything that was in the data set. 
but the data set could, could have, and usually has, a lot of noise. And it's not good learning the noise. So uh, going all the, the way down to here is not very good because uh, what it happens is that the validation error, which you can identify with the generalization error, okay, first goes down and down and down. So the network generalizes well, meaning that it gives a good output for unseen examples, okay? But it comes a point, which here I, I denoted it optimal as top, in which it starts, this validation error starts increasing again. Okay, it's not good going beyond this because it means it has overlearned the sample and is producing a bad result in a, a generalization. So this is why this, this zone here is called underlearning or underfitting also. And this zone here is called overlearning or overfitting. You have overused the data uh, to do predictions, okay? This is the classical one, okay? How do you find this optimal stop? This is another matter. And usually there is a lot of things to do with the hyperparameters of the net. I'm not going to go into that now. Well, here you have a still before the turning point, you have underfitting, after overfitting, but this, remark this very much, this is in the underparameterized scenario, which roughly speaking means that uh, the number of weights is less than the number of samples in your data set. This used to be like that because getting uh, when computing was, was what it was, uh, getting more weights than samples, it was difficult because samples very easily go to the millions, the, the number of samples, whereas getting, the, uh, uh, getting networks with uh, a number of weights above uh, millions, it was not so easy. Now this ch has changed slowly or, or rather quite fast, quite fast in the last years, because there is a, 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 a very increased computing power, a very good computing platforms and so on. So we can go to uh, the overparameterized training. And now the questions of what happens with the overparameterized networks, you can take the number of parameters, the number of weights as an indication of the complexity of the network. And therefore the complexity is a measure of the complexity of the functions computed by this network. Well, uh, a scenario favored by the increasing computing power has been addressed in the last few years. And the answers so far are surprising, surprising breakthroughs. So I have, I will explain this and do a little break. What it has been found experimentally, and now there are already some tentative expl theoretical explanations is what is called the phenomenon, the phenomenon of the double descent. It is depicted here, okay? Now here in the, in the, in the horizontal axis, the, what you have is the complexity of the, of the network. So it's a variable complexity, okay? If this complexity is uh, beyond a threshold, Again, determined, uh, uh, you know how, or <laughs> it depends on 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 the kind of uh, context in which you are working. So, uh, if you are with a complexity beyond uh, this threshold, then you have the the conventional training phase. So the training uh, diminishes the training error. It diminishes first the 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 generalizing error, but then after the turning, this turning point, the, the, the generalizing error starts to increase up to this threshold. And then the big surprise is this double descent phase, which means that if the number of parameters are beyond this threshold, then what you observe is that 
you reduce the training error to zero, even if the labels are completely random. So it learns by road that this network, the uh, whatever training data set you have presented to it. But after this threshold, it starts decreasing again the test error and therefore the generalizations the generalization error increases and it goes up to a point that is lower than what you could achieve here with uh, less weights, okay? Well, this picture is adapted from figure one from nine. Nine is the air tail I mentioned earlier, direction to artificial, excuse me, I said nine, okay? Reconciling modern machine learning and the bias variance trade-off, you have here the, the paper. Okay, now mm, this, this slide just uh, explains in words uh, what I have been uh, saying in orally. Um, here, I think that 11 presents two models of the descent and 12 is an important first step in understanding the phenomenon of double descent. I think that this, uh, this paper is beyond this course, but uh, it's very interesting. It uses uh, random matrix theory. Now, further references, you have an overview of deep learning and neural networks. This is, a, although is, mm, I think it's Smith Hoover. Uh, yes, 13, Smith Hoover, deep learning and neural networks. This is 2015. But it's a very good, uh, very good uh, paper. Then you have 15 mathematical underpinnings of Camus and Linear Network, a paper by Malat, the advisor of John Bruna. 16 deep versus shallow performance of neural networks. 17 mathematics of deep learning. 18 University of Deep Camus and Linear Networks, and so on. And I think. It is, it is appropriate to finish with uh, a quotation of Donahoe, um, David Donahoe. He was the Gauss Prize in the ICM 2018 in Rio, and he received before the Shaw Prize. He's a professor at the Stanford. And I think that after talking quite a bit, Joan Bruna, about the, the curse of dimensionality, it is good that mentioning that Donahoe in 2000, in 2000 uh, spoke about the blessings of dimensionality and said they are, are less widely noted, but they include the concentration of measure phenomenon, so-called in the geometry of Banaka spaces, which means that, the, that certain random fluctuations are very well controlled in high dimensions and the success of asymptotic methods used widely in mathematical statistics and statistical physics, which suggests that the statements about very high dimensional settings may, may be made, where may be made, sorry, where moderate dimensions would be too complicated. So training techniques, I think I will take, if you allow me, uh, 50, 10 or 15 minutes. Let's see, is the, uh, would you like that uh, within 10 minutes we return? Is there anybody against? So let me take 10 minutes. I think by my clock, this should be around uh, 5.15 or 5.16, roughly speaking. See you in a moment. Let's see if there are questions. Um, well, uh, Alberto Torrejón says, this just blow my mind. So if we had infinitely parameters, then could we get our test error to be zero or we will always sum error. No, what I said is that when the number of parameters go beyond 
uh, the, that threshold. So you go to the overparameterized uh, neural networks, you almost always get zero training error. Zero training error. But uh, uh, the error, uh, you know, you have to converge. And the convergence depends not only on the, on the depth of the, of the neural network and the width, but uh, it depends on these parameters. And when you increase the number of neurons, this has an effect on the convergence of the algorithms. And therefore, uh, you cannot go to infinity. You go to infinity as a, a limiting case in order to study what is called uh, well, um, asymptotic statistics. Uh, we are going to say something about this a little later. Alberto, does this answer your question? Okay, and then you have Kai. Are there any reasons to use so many layers? Since one has talked about results in universal approximation, the ReLU only needs like three to the most continuous functions arbitrarily well. Yes, there are reasons. And I gave you, um, I gave you a, a paper, I, I don't remember exactly now, but it is in these slides uh, saying about the advantages of the depth uh, of neural networks, okay? From the theoretical point of view, it is true that you can approximate uh, by using very few layers, but uh, then there are very many advantages in having, uh, in having many layers because it is somehow what happens in our neocortex. So there is a first layer. This first layer processes the input and produces a new, a new, fe new features associated to this picture. Next layer produces features of features and so on. And this process of getting features of features of features is very important to uh, generalize uh, to uh, increase the generalizing power of the network. Uh, so that at the end, uh, you, could for, you can, for example, do um, segmentation of video online directly in the stream of video. This would not be possible with uh, shallow networks, I believe. There are a few things that we already said uh, last Thursday but for the special case of uh, the empirical loss. So the goal is to minimize the empirical loss. In the notations I used in the first session, is L hat of W, it depends on the weights. And this is uh, the average of a loss that only depends on the jth uh, data, data and the jth item in the data. Uh, of W. Um, for example, one of the most used, especially when in regression, that you have real numbers, then you have the F FW of X upper J minus Y upper J squared. This is the, the loss incurred by the, the data item X upper J at the end. Now, the gradient descent applied to L to this loss uses the entire data set. And you may imagine with is this W is reset. Sorry, this should be W. W. It was, a, it was an X before but today is a W. So you reset W as W minus this uh, learning uh, step, eta times the gradient of the whole, uh, the whole loss function. Yes, it is a sum of the law of the gradient of, of the, the private one, the particular ones, but this sum may be very, very huge. So it's not very convenient. Now the stochastic gradient descent relies on a stochastic approximation of the gradient, uh, typically by using a random subset of the data. 
This is called a random mini batch. The extreme case is what is called online graded descent, in which a single data item is used at, at each step. So you do, you update W as W minus eta gradient of the LI. And you go through all I uh, in succession. Well, what does it mean? Well, it means that this gradient of LI will have something, will be uh, compatible, will be some sort of an estimate, maybe not so good, but an, an estimate of the gradient of the whole, the whole thing. And uh, on the average, it will point toward the gradient. So this should work. And it has the advantage that, that you only have to go once through all the items. An epoch is going through each item at a time and computing this. Of course, then you may need several epochs uh, in order to guarantee convergence of the whole process. Uh, here, of course, you wouldn't succeed unless you were quite smart about, uh, about taking variable data, about learning rates that are adapted to what is going on in the process. Now, uh, as far as just saying it in the form of an algorithm, uh, the online learning procedure for one epoch is, uh, has the following steps. The first one is optional, is to randomly shuffle the items in the data set, because otherwise, since you have to do it several times, it could very well happen that you would have cycles that uh, would not lead you to where you want to be, which is go to a minimum or to a relative, to a relative minimum. So this is a, a step that mm, customarily it is done on the data sets. So you have an input, an initial W, you do it at random or you fix in some way or another. And then you do this uh, for J in the whole range of the data set. You do this adaptation with this gradient, which is very simple. This function is usually very simple. This gradient is very simple. For example, in the case of quadratic, this gradient is linear. So uh, this, this update is very simple. And when you finish, you have done an epoch and you return a W. Naturally, the, the full algorithm repeats this as I said before. Now, this has a little variant, which is very, very important and very useful, uh, which is uh, the mini batch learning procedure. Again, I will do it for one epoch. And usually you need several epochs. You have an initial weight, W, so you set the weights in some way. Often the weights for large networks are set by some sort of uh, uh, Gau Gaussian distribution. So you take a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and uh, um, variant sigma, some sigma. The sigma may be dependent on conditions of the network. And then you do this initialization. Now, the next step is that you split, sorry, You split the range of integers for an one to an M, remember that this can be very, very, very high, very big, into mini batches. This means that you do, you take this interval as the union of J1, J2, Js, a certain number. This number may be also quite, quite big because the mini batch usually is a small compared to the size M of, of the whole data set. And now what you do is the same as before, but instead of updating for a single LJ, you take, you update for this, I, I should have divided by the number of, uh, uh, of elements in the, in the mini batch, okay? You update this, although this wouldn't matter because the eta can be also adjusted. So you take the, the, the gradient of the sum of, uh, the losses for the data corresponding to the mini batch. And you do this, 
and at the end you return W. Uh, there are very many adaptive, uh, adaptive policies on the learning rate, and you could look for this at 220, which is uh, this paper by Duki, Hassel, and Singer, adaptive subgrading methods for online learning and stochastic factorization. Okay, let's go to the last part, the neural tangent kernel. Uh, this is a, a, quite a difficult subject, I think, uh, and I have had trouble in, to manage to tell you something that uh, is meaningful in the time in the time that uh, I have. Okay, so um, I, we are going to to look at the setup for this then the relation to gradient descent. Then uh, we are going to, uh, to analyze the gradient flux, what is called the gradient flux and the corresponding tangent kernel. And this will be after one, which is I already mentioned at the beginning, but at the end I decided that it was better to use uh, our interpretation with, with John Bruna in, in, the, in, the, in this paper. Uh, this is in Catalan, but I have adapted it to English as best as I have, I have been able to do. So the setup uh, used in paper number one, and also in, in our paper, is a fully connected neural network of depth D and with widths width N0 and N1 and D of the different, different layers. Uh, the activation has to be according to one, although the, I think this, and also the authors think that it can work uh, under more general conditions, twice differentiable with bounded second derivative. Well, the, the best example for this is the soft plus, which we already meant, uh, met before. This soft plus is the, this curve in blue, blue, blue. Now the derivative is the logistic, which is this thing in, in orange. And then the second derivative is this function, which is this curve here, okay? This, it goes, uh, the, the maximum is one, one fourth. Uh, of course, the, the sigmoid goes through zero here and it's symmetric around zero. And this, as I said before, was an approximation of the realm. So th this could be okay uh, to do the whole theory. Maybe others also, but let's just stick to this. So um, the number of uh, weights in this network is uh, this sum from zero to n, d minus one, nj times nj plus one, plus nj plus one. Set this way, it's easier because nj times nj plus one is uh, the number of uh, connections between the, la the layer lj and the lj plus one. And the nj plus one coming from the sum, this the sum here, is the bias. The parameters come from the bias. All together, this is the dimension. This, of course, in the fully connected uh, network is very high, very high number. Uh, in any case, the parameter space of these weights is R to the N, which is a Euclidean space. We may call it weight space. But just to be in, uh, in line with notations of Zambruna and also of several papers, I think I will switch here uh, to the following notation. Instead of W, the, the set of uh, the parameter space will be called capital theta. So this is our N with this N. And uh, the Ws will be denoted by theta. So instead of F, FW, you have F theta. This goes, this is the, the, what the computation of the network. If the parameters, if the weights are theta, is a map from R and zero to R and D. 
This defines a function in space. I will call it f, curly f, which is the space of these maps, f theta, of these kind of maps from Rn0 to Rnd. And the map that uh, sends the parameters to the, param to the function, I'm going to call it phi. So for five goes from the parameter space, theta, Euclidean space, to f. Uh, therefore, this is sort of a parameterization of f. But this parameterization can be redundant. So different f's can go, different thetas can go to the same f. And uh, the f, whatever it leaves, can be a very complicated geometry, as we will see. Now, there is. Uh, as it must uh, in all this business, there has to be uh, a cost functional. I'm going to write it capital E. It goes from the functions to R because a E uh, is mm, the empirical loss, which in, uh, in the first lecture, first session, I denote it by L hat. But here I think it's better to put uh, E F because I need a twiddle in E, so this is better. Um, this is E of F, uh, and only depends, this empirical error, only depends on the data points, on, on, on the data points, including, of course, uh, what the expert or the supervisor has, has said about them. Well, training in this setup is uh, optimizing F theta in F, before we said optimizing in, in the parameter space, but we want to, uh, an optimizing in F with respect to the cost E. Now, if we want to go to the parameter space, we have to compose phi with uh, this empirical error. And this uh, is a function from the parameter space to R, which I will denote by E, e to E dot. Even if E is were convex, for example, in the case of the difference of a squares is convex, uh, this combination is generally not convex. And this, you can, for this, you can have fine details in 22, uh, Choromasca, Genave, Mathieu, Arus, and Lecun. Lecun is one of the big guys in deep learning. Uh, the lost surfaces of multiplier networks. Okay, this is a paper, uh, not very long but uh, it deals with this, with this matter, okay? So of why this is non complex. Now we could apply gradient descent to E twiddle, starting with some E zero. Yes, we can do that. This would read theta K plus one equals theta K minus eta of gradient of uh, E twiddle at theta K. This is, just as gradient descent goes. Now, but this, we can transform this a little bit by doing the following. Uh, this uh, gradient descent can be reinterpreted geometrically from the linear approximation of E twiddle around theta k. For this, we assume a mild assumption that E twiddle is beta regular and uh, that eta is less than the inverse of beta. Okay, so this allows you to write that e to the of theta is e to in the neighborhood of theta k. e to the of theta is e to the of theta k plus the gradient gradient of e to the at theta k dot theta minus theta k plus eta minus one the norm of theta minus theta k squared. And this uh, allows us to write the, the, the optimization as a variational, a variational problem, which is this. You take the minimum, so you minimize this here, okay? To define the theta k plus one. You take the minimum argument of this, e to the of theta k plus gray plus this gray plus this, okay? And this gives you a new update and you iterate. This method allows to find local minima of e twiddle with no curves of dimensionality. This is a big progress. In fact, it can be seen 
that for an error, a tolerance error epsilon, the number of iterations you need to converge up to an epsilon approximation of a local minimum is O twiddle of epsilon minus two. Well, epsilon minus two does not have epsilon minus the dimension, it's only n minus two. But we put O twiddle to denote that this is like the O. So uh, it would be, the O would be less than or equal a constant times epsilon minus two. The O twiddle is the same, but ignoring log logarithmic factors or, or polylogarithmic factors uh, depend, that put can depend on the dimension and so on, D different parameters. So this is a very good, very good result theoretically. This you can see 23, which is a paper that I already mentioned in, in the, the, the talk uh, last uh, Thursday, Jim Netrapali, Jordan, Kakak de Jordan, on the non-convex optimization for machine learning, gradients, stochasticity, and so on. It's a very important paper, and it's very recent. Now, let's go to the gradient flux and the tangent kernel. You, th there are two ways of uh, learning what happens when the number of river nodes become very large without, without uh, paying attention to the conversions or not, okay? One is just letting the number of neurons, neurons grow, maybe with some conditions, and then figuring out what do you get at the end? But there is another way, which is taking already a continuous model uh, corresponding to the discret discretized model of the gradient descent. So the, 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 the continuous model uh, of the discretized model of the gradient descent is this ordinary differential equation that the theta dot, the derivative with respect to t, is minus the gradient of e tilde theta. Uh, this, if you, if you put here a random initial condition sampled from certain probability distribution on the parameter space, then you can solve the equation and you get uh, a solution, okay? This equation is known as gradient flux because you just mm, follow the negative of the, of the gradient as a tangent vector to the curve. Mm. It defines this continuous dynamic, this continuous curve, little theta of t belonging to capital theta for t bigger or, to, bigger or equal than zero. The corresponding dynamics on the function of space f will be the, the, the phi of the theta t. Let me call h of t. Now the chain rule applied to this gives you a derivative of the following form. H dot is minus, some, minus the gradient times an expression that has this form. Is the differential of phi at theta of t times the same differential transpose. Uh, let's see, the differential of phi of phi at the point is a linear map from the tangent space to the parameter space at the point, which is Rn, R capital N, sorry. Um, to Rn, uh, to the tension space at phi of theta of the function space. So this, this is uh, how the differentials go, a linear map. Now, uh, the, the chain rule gives you that here you have to put the differential of phi of t transpose. So you, in some sense, you go forward from the parameter of space, the tangent to the parameter of space, to the tangent to the, uh, to the function of space. And now with the transpose, you go back to uh, the tangent of space of the parameter of space, okay? Now the difficulty of this equation, the main difficulty, and this will be, I will talk a little bit today, but the main lecture of next Thursday by Jean Bruno will be about that, is that uh, the, this, this thing, this expression, which by the way, is called the tangent kernel, 
uh, you will see why. This uh, is very uh, difficult to, to know how this will vary with T. It's very difficult, okay? Uh, understanding this is difficult. And actually the, the main progress on that, as, we'll, as John Bruno will say, comes from uh, insights for, of mathematical physics, especially uh, uh, statistical physics. Now here you have a, a, this illustration uh, may help you in, in having some intuition about all that. Here you have the parameter space. Here you have the initial point. And this through the kernel evolution gives a curve, okay? The curve, uh, the tangent is minus the gradient of, uh, of the function, okay? And this goes all along. Now, when you do the phi, this starts at h0 equals phi of theta zero, and it gives a curve h of t on the function space. Of course, you have the old, uh, the old if it, if, if t have a star, which is uh, the expert or uh, the supervisor. It's a function that in principle does not have to belong uh, to the, the, function, the, the function space f, okay? The only thing you can do, you can hope for, is that the function f, the function space f allows you to approximate f star, okay? Now, uh, the, dif the differential of phi, of phi at theta of t uh, goes from the tangent space here to the tangent space here. And this is uh, some, you here you have the gradient of, of E of h of t. And this gradient, if you project it to the tangent of h t is this. And uh, well, and the, the, differ the differential transpose goes from this tangent space to here. This is as much as I can say about having some illustration. Now, in fact, the temporal variation of K of T can be understood geometrically as the curvature of the function of space F. Well, this would need a lot of elaboration to arrive to this point. Uh, at the point HT. In the case of a fully connected neural, uh, neural network, as in equation two, an important result is, and you can look at one, two, 24 and 25, we will see now in a moment what they are. When do you remember what is? Uh, that this curve is tends to zero when the net width tends to infinity. So you make it wider and wider, then uh, these people prove that this k of t tends to a constant k of zero, tends to the initializing uh, uh, kernel, okay? Uh, and this is uniformly in finite time. Well, one is uh, the, the Jean, sorry, the Jacot Gabriel Ongler, neural tension kernel. The two is Shizat Oyaron Bach, which is lazy training in differential programming. And I forgot the other numbers, 24 and 25. 21st do Jai Oxos and Singh, graded descent provably optimizes over parameterized neural networks. Of course, by what I have all we have said today, this should be of much interest to you, I think. And uh, 25 by also by Du, but other authors, Li, Wang, Jai, graded descent finds global minima in deep neural networks. These are very important papers and they are, as uh, you see from uh, 2019 and uh, 2019 as well, okay? Okay. Now, um, let's, for, for example, in the case of the shallow net, considered by Jean Brun at the beginning, consider this function phi of theta x. So this is the function associated to, this should be 
f sub theta f sub theta of x, okay? But uh, in terms of phi is phi of theta x. Is the neuron denoted like this is the neuron defined by one uh, and normalized by putting here, dividing by the square root of n, okay? Uh, I don't remember now if one was defined by normalizing or not. I think it was not, okay? If the parameters theta j are sampled uh, independently uh, and uh, identically, according to some distribution, same distribution, the tangent kernel turns out to be, this again is some work, uh, k of t, uh, of x, x prime, because this is present. And this, working hard with this, has a limit, which is this, when the width goes to infinity. Uh, and the conclusion of this is that under fairly general conditions, C26, Raimi, Becht, Recht, et al., uh, random features for large scale kernel machines, uh, Again, it's, a, it's old, an old paper, but it's important. Then um, the tension kernel of finite width in the net concentrates uniformly toward k bar with fluctuations of order one divided by a square root of m. This is why we divide it by this. In the asymptotic regime, which means width tending to infinity and considering for simplicity the loss one half of h minus f star norm square, the trading dynamics get simplified to f dot equals k bar times the gradient of f of t, which is, because this is linear, minus k bar times this linear, linear thing, which corresponds to the linear dynamics associated to a linear regression model in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated to k bar. Well, this I, I, gave, I, I give as understood what we said uh, on Thursday, on Tuesday last week about reproducing kernels, okay? This space associated to K-bar, this Hilbert space, allows a more precise study of questions concerning approximation, generalization and optimization. With this parameterization, the white neural networks behave as linear models. Characterized by the tensile kernel that remains constant after initialization. And this is the lazy training. It is true that this phenomenon allows to understand the reason, the reason of the good behavior of the great descent, uh, but uh, it does not explain mathematically here that should see, but it does not. Uh, explain the math mathematically the advantages of the nonlinear models defining, defined by neural networks. This will be studied in this section by uh, John Bruno. Now, uh, I finish with this slide and the rest, I will try to give you a little bit of practice with uh, uh, with, with the notebooks that we saw uh, last Thursday, some other more, more notebooks. Well, here, I don't know, this is so hard maybe by, by some that uh, this change the, the, the learning, the course on creative writing changed the mind. I think that should be of the men here in this picture. I think I'll become a literary agent instead of, of a writer. Well, don't do that. A stick to, even if it's difficult, is not uh, unreachable, and uh, you can get a lot out of studying the materials we, we have been working on. Uh, so now I have to find, let, allow me a, a few minutes, uh, where do I have? Mm. I think you should see uh, a spreadsheet and the examples. 
well, pre-examples because they, they have not had much time to work on them and they need uh, further development, okay? But um, I think that I will run this um, principal component analysis. Uh, the thing I am showing you here is our version. You will have, I will give it to you later. Uh, this, this, uh, error here, because this, as I said, it allows you to work and save a copy and modify the copy if you want. You couldn't modify these ones here, okay? Now this is, um, copy, and I go to, there you go. Okay, sorry for this delay. Um, but this is just the other day. There are some, something that you have to load. Run anyway. This is beautiful, I think, because uh, it's a reproduction by using deep learning of this paper by Fisher. By the way, I I hope I didn't uh, I didn't explain this to you already, Victor. No, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is a beautiful paper, an old paper by Fisher, uh, in which he explored uh, iris data, some kinds of flowers. And, uh, and I think that reproducing it with a principal component analysis is a very nice uh, exercise, both of using the collab, both also of using Python and all the libraries, and also, uh, last but not least, understanding Fisher's paper in terms of principal component analysis. Okay, so here you we run this, which is the data. And uh, here you see names, sepal length, se these are features, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, target is, the, the, the three sorts of irises that he considered. Now, this info here, this is a long table as uh, usually. So sepal length are 150 uh, length and so on floats. So this is a table. Head of the table, so you see uh, the iris setosa. Uh, th th there are two more kinds of this flower, um, and now you do PCA. Well, these are histograms. It's not very interesting. We put these histograms on sepal length, petal length, sepal width, petal width. Uh, this is not very informative. Um, now the PCA, PCA computations is principal components, um, PCA dot feed transform X and so on. That's the, the, the work that is explained theoretically in an appendix of the, of the session, of the first part of the session on the first, month, the first Tuesday, okay? And um, oops, this has given an error and this I will not know how to solve this. And therefore, oh, sorry. Well, I'll try. I'll try your, your version, which maybe is correct.
I will run all of them already. Yeah, this is where for some reason uh, uh, there was a, again, a misprint in some place and this is fatal. But here you have the thing, the conclusion. So, of course, the axes are not the same unit, have, are different units. This goes from minus three to four and so on. Uh, and therefore, you have to take into account this, this fact. Now, you take only two components. The first component, the one that uh, that explains the maximum variance of the data, and the second component that is the, the orthogonal vector to the principal component, explaining the, the next uh, variability of the data. So, and here you get the classification quite clearly. Irisetosa is the, the red. This, if you can, should be 50 points. Iris versic versicolor in green and Iris virginica in blue. So it, the system has learned how to classify uh, these, uh, these, these flowers, at least in the examples in the data set. Of course, if this has the look that it should generalize well, and therefore giving data of other similar flowers of, this, of one of these three kinds, the classification should be quite good. Okay, well, here you have that the first component explains 0.92% uh, of, uh, of the variance, and the second explains only 0 0.05 of the variability. So it means that the, the two together explain almost all the variability in the data. Well, these are just complements, uh, theoretical and so on. And for some reason it repeated, so for, forget about it. Now, another one that we could look at is just linear regression, but done with a stochastic gradient descent. So let's see if it works. Again, let me just run everything from, from a start. Okay, this is done, this is done. Uh, the model is just the, uh, the risk, the empirical risk minimization. And uh, in here, you use one of the features of Python, which is defining a, cl a class. Uh, and in particular, you define the model for doing this, um, which, I mean, the only way to figure this out is just getting it and studying it carefully. Uh, the data, and now here, this is, Mm, the untrained uh, random line uh, used at the beginning. And these are the data points that you want to approximate. Now, if you do a standard a stochastic gradient descent, then we should see that this line, which is the beginning, should approximate uh, slowly or should approximate the line that would represent the regression line of these points. And this, uh, well, this should, well, I should run this so that you can see it. Um, okay, so this is, an ep each epoch gives a better approximation of, uh, <coughs> The, the regression line of the points. And uh, it has, of course, you could have many more points, 
you could here change the epochs and so on and so forth, okay? And once it finishes, it goes, Epoch 28, I think they are probably 40 or 50 epochs. As you see now, it does not do anything good because it does not move the, the, the black line. Um, now it finished at, yes, 40 epochs. So, and here at the end, you get a summary of the W, how they have been moving, and the double, the true W that should have found. They, they, it's not exact because uh, <clears throat> uh, it's only an approximation. And then uh, similar with the, the B, the blue, and uh, how it goes approximating it. You see, after epoch 20, it does not do very much because we are already there. Okay. Now, finally, um, the regression polynomial. Well, I can do the regression, uh, the logistic regression, just so that you can see it. And uh, before the end, I will copy these uh, these errors on the right, which are for you. I'll copy them in the chat so that you can have it. It's very difficult to do machine learning without having some suitable computational tools to, uh, to experiment. Um, this is a very a magnificent tool. And this is why I am trying to present it to you. Again, I will do the runtime for all. These notebooks are very nice because they allow you to document in, in roughly in LaTeX what you are going, what you are saying. You can put links to relevant uh, machine learning uh, webs and so on. Okay. Now this um, this is a, a mod modified list. This uh, data set in images. So this is, uh, it is classification. It was a very important model for uh, classifying digits, handwritten digits, millions of handwritten digits by anybody in envelopes, in bank, bank checks and so on. And it was a breakthrough to, uh, to teach, uh, uh, to, to teach a, a neural network to classify them very better than the humans, okay? This is just an example. This is the original three and uh, classified by PCA. You see how fast it goes to the classification and uh, you get this, the test image and the image with PCA explaining 95% of variance. And this is just enough, okay? Uh, the, I think that in maybe toward the end, I will explain you the, the full, uh, full notebook doing this classification, okay? Well, here there are very many things, so let, uh, let, let me forget it. Now, let me go to the chat. Okay. Pedro Delicado has said to me, well, you can leave any time you want. So, um, yes. So I'll copy this. No, it's not good. Copy. 
and I put it here in the chat. Then you, then you can, when you download it, you make a copy, you can name it as you like. So these are the names given by Collab. But in, lo in the local, in, in, uh, in the hard disk, I have them with meaningful names for me. Of course, uh, the advantage of Python is that uh, it's a, a very nice general purpose uh, language. It's object oriented, it's for functional, uh, it's very clear syntax. Uh, it has a reasonably good uh, error reporting. Uh, and I think that this allows you to learn many things at the same time, but in particular, uh, practical machine learning, okay? Again, there are very many books about this. Uh, if you go to any place in Google or uh, you put Python machine learning and you are going to find dozens of, of, of items. Okay, today I have no more to say. I think that we spent the two hours already. So uh, I think that uh, next talk is uh, Thursday by Joan Bruna, and I believe that is at two. Uh, you should remember this, is at two. Uh, then my next talk will be uh, on uh, November two at four. This will be a geometric, uh, about geometry, um, which is important in, in manifold learning. It's important in dealing with symmetries and variances and covariances and so on. So I'm going to try to make a good summary of what you need about all, all these topics. And uh, my final uh, session is on November 9. I will be in Valladolid in a Congress, but I will run the session from there. So there will be no problem, okay? Thank you very much for your attention and see you next time. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, comment that I think that the second link or the, the, the second notebook is not, or it's not giving access, I think. The second? I, I, yeah. Well, let me reproduce it again and see. Yeah, it, it, asks, it, it asks for permission. Is that okay? Let, let me check. No, uh, it's like restricted somehow. Well, I will I will make an amendment of this, and I will share with you next time. Okay. okay. Or, Thank you. or yes, it, uh, this is the better. Okay. Thank you. Since we are doing this with uh, Eduardo Ulises Moya, uh, as you see, you can see here that it has not yet my my uh, my acceptance of this of these book, notebooks okay uh, because i think there is uh, many things still to to improve in particular this one thank you